Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 23 of the Pet Behavior Chat. So today I'm going to talk about something that is actually really close to my heart, and it's one of the reasons I actually got into veterinary behavior medicine, um, because I realized how much um, our patients' physical health um, is impacts their mental and emotional health. So, you know, we talk about that whole kind of triad of mental, emotional um, and physical health, or we also have cognitive health in there. So mental, emotional, cognitive and physical health, um, all of those things really go hand in hand and determine behavior. And I have to say that I've been absolutely amazed at how many of my residency behavior cases. So for my residency, um, I had to see 400 clinical behavior cases. I'm now on case number 412. So I'm well over the 400 um, behavior cases needed for my residency. But the number of those cases that had a physical health contribution to behavior and really only when we managed to treat also the physical health contribution um, as well as the behavioral health or mental and emotional health aspects of the behavior, did we really achieve the outcomes that we were looking for? So I thought I would do today's episode a little bit about um, my kind of top five physical health contributions to um, behavioral presentations. Um, just to give you a bit of an overview of how broad that they can be um, and how significant that they can be as well. However, before we get started on my top five, I just want to caveat um, that by saying, of course, any physical health um, condition, even if I don't mention it right now in my top five, any physical health uh, condition can have an effect on behavior because we know that physical and behavioral health are absolutely intertwined. You know, it's difficult to separate the two of them. Um, so even if I don't mention something in my top five, um, it absolutely can have an effect. And I could probably have a top 10. There are probably so many more things that I could talk about. But these five are probably the ones that I see most commonly. Um, and I might even sneak in a bonus number six uh, in there. But we'll do the top five first and we'll see where we where we get to. Um, and yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting um, to kind of chat about and discover really quite how significant physical health is on behavior and why we as veterinarians need to really be involved in these behavior cases because it's up to us to kind of find those physical health contributions, assess them, treat them, manage them um, so that we have a chance of really making a big difference in that pet's behavioral health as well. All right, here we go. So I'm going to kind of do a little bit of a countdown backwards um, and I think actually I will sneak in a number six in there as well. Um, but one of the things, so my first one is gastrointestinal health. So many, many of my behavior patients will have some kind of a gastrointestinal presentation, whether that's that they're picky eaters or they don't have great appetite or that perhaps they have runny poos um, or inconsistently formed um, poo or stool, uh, you know, quite regularly or that they vomit occasionally um, or yeah, that they, they have perhaps sort of signs also almost of inflammatory bowel disease or colitis. We see um, stress colitis or stress gastritis, especially during stressful events. So I see that a lot during air travel or perhaps if we're moving house or during cattery or kennel stays, we can get this kind of stress colitis where they might have, um, you know, runny stool, maybe with mucus, maybe with fresh blood. So a lot of them have gastrointestinal presentations. And there's actually a really nice, I think it's a conference proceeding about um, the kind of the intertwinedness of gastrointestinal health and behavioral health, which I'll put in the show notes. Um, but yeah, that's something that, that I see very, very commonly. And I do treat the gastrointestinal signs. Um, it depends on the individual patient. But what I also see is that oftentimes when we start to reduce anxiety and when we actually start to treat behavioral health, the gastrointestinal signs can also get better very quickly. So all of a sudden appetite becomes better um, and, you know, we might not have 
those um, episodes of vomiting or, or perhaps inconsistent stool so much. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg. Um, so we can have obviously gastrointestinal ill health that can call a cause a patient to feel anxious or stressed or irritable or not very well. But we can also have behavioral health issues. So anxiety causing gastrointestinal health presentations. And sometimes it can be difficult to know what came first or, you know, what what's the cause and effect. And eventually we we end up treating both anyway or we we end up assessing both anyway but it's really important that we look at those um, gastrointestinal health presentations now part of that is obviously the microbiome and there's a lot of talk both in human health as well as in veterinary health there's a lot of um, talk about the the microbiome and how important that is for behavioral health and how much that can affect um, our brains and our mental and emotional health. Um, so that's something that we are looking at more and more and we're thinking about the microbiome and how we can optimize that, keep it healthy. Um, we use a lot of probiotics um, in, in that regard. Um, so the microbiome obviously is a big part of that gastro gastrointestinal health presentation. But I will definitely put the, the link to the conference proceedings in the show notes because it's a really interesting read and it's really interesting to see how the two affect each other. So that's my first one, gastrointestinal health. My second one is skin disease. And again, there's a really great paper um, that I'm going to put in the show notes um, that's, that looks at atopic uh, dermatitis. So that's allergic skin disease and its effects on anxiety, um, stress and aggressive behaviors. And there is definitely a correlation there. And I have a lot, a lot, a lot of patients that have um, skin disease that have perhaps atopic dermatitis. Um, I am thinking about a couple of French bulldogs that I have in particular that um, have, you know, managed um, atopic dermatitis, but that can occasionally flare up. And whenever we have a flare up in the atopic dermatitis, if they get very itchy or if they've, you know, got red skin and we've got a flare up in that skin condition, then usually their behavioral health also deteriorates. Um, and it's not uncommon to see dogs reacting aggressively um, if they're if they're very sort of irritated and red and itchy and maybe even sore and painful because they've scratched at it and it's now become secondarily infected the skin um, and we you know we now have kind of these really horrible sort of nasty um, skin presentations that can be pussy or erythematous, red, itchy, scaly, scabby. Um, and sometimes physical touch can then lead to them reacting defensively, snapping, biting, showing aggressive behaviors because they just don't want to be touched on that skin. And both of my French bulldog patients definitely presented in that way. So um, whenever they get a flare up of their skin disease, they can get um, a little bit snappy, defensive and show aggressive behaviors. So we need to make sure that we manage the skin condition well in order to prevent aggressive events and in order to make sure that they don't have deterioration in their behavioral health. So that's um, that's a big one. And obviously included in skin disease is also um, earache, otitis, otitis externa, ear infections, sore ears. Um, we know many of our canine as well as feline patients uh, really struggle when they've got sore ears. Um, in fact, I just saw a little kitty cat yesterday who um, we think is experiencing pain for a number of different reasons, but um, that little cat also had um, an ear infection in one ear. Um, and we know that, you know, if if we ask clients or if you're a pet caregiver and you are asked to medicate your pet's sore ear, that that can sometimes be you know, not very easy. They can, you know, run away as soon as the ear drop bottle comes out of the cupboard um, and then, you know, asking them to kind of sit still and tolerate um, having eardrops administered can be really difficult um, because it, it, it is, you know, essentially quite painful. Um, and um, they can also react defensively and snap if we try and apply eardrops to them. So we usually combat this by, you know, treating them systemically with tablets first. Um, and then once we've sort of reduced the initial flare up, the initial pain, um, then we perhaps go in secondarily and then we start to use drops and um, topical treatment. 
And another really great thing in these situations is um, cooperative care training. So Ilsa, who is my wonderful behavior modification expert who I work with, I'm sure you've heard her on previous podcast episodes. So that's one of the things that Ilsa is amazing at is teaching cooperative care strategy strategies. So teaching dogs to be able to have a bit of a voice when it comes to having medication administered to them. So we'll often teach them a chin rest, maybe for eardropper application. And when they move their chin away from the hand, we know, okay, they need a break or, um, you know, they don't consent right now in this moment to having their ears treated. Um, and that gives us really good information as to A, how painful they might be, but B, how also anxious and worried and unhappy and irritable they are about, um, about their ear condition or skin condition. So skin and ears, that's my number two contributor. Number three, we have endocrine diseases. And I'm thinking here a little bit about um, hyperthyroid cats, for example. So we know that cats with overactive thyroid glands can become very irritable and can show aggressive behaviors, um, definitely. Um, and that's because we have this increased level of irritability, um, you know, this high metabolism, this very sort of irritable cat that's unable to settle um, and that can respond aggressively. Um, moving away slightly there from the endocrine, I also see that in cats with high blood pressure, for example, they can become very irritable. They don't want to be touched. They don't want to be handled. You know, they almost can't sit still. Um, and that can definitely cause um, aggressive incidents and definitely be, uh, changes in behavior as well. So that's a little bit the kitty cats. Now for dogs, similarly, um, we can get behavior changes from hormonal changes. And yes, thyroid is also something that we think about in dogs. In dogs, we more commonly see hypothyroidism. So that's low thyroid hormone levels, um, which has in the past been associated with aggression. Um, I don't believe we uh, see it quite as clear cut as that anymore. Um, but certainly we can see behavior changes in dogs that have low thyroid levels. Um, and we can see changes, changes in behavior in dogs and cats that perhaps have Cushing's disease or Addison's disease or anything else to do with, um, with hormonal differences. We can also sometimes see tumors, adrenal tumors that start sec secreting um, sex hormones. And all of a sudden we can see cats that start to behave as if they haven't been neutered again, you know, they start urine marking or maybe showing mounting behaviors or more aggressive behaviors. Um, and that can sometimes come from tumors that are secreting these hormones into the bloodstream. Um, so yeah, hormones or hormonal presentations can be really complex and really quite interesting. Um, and yes, oftentimes require quite a complex workup, especially yeah, if the presentation isn't typical. So if you have an older cat, maybe a seven, eight, nine year old cat that all of a sudden starts to show behaviors as if they were not neutered, then it's definitely a time to investigate. And also remember, um, ladies that are on hormone replacement therapy, if they have gels or creams that they rub into their arms or legs, and if perhaps the cat or dog licks those areas, that can also cause them to ingest the hormone and, and that can cause behavioral changes. So sometimes you have to really go on a bit of a detective hunt and, um, you know, look for what might be going on in some of these more atypical complicated cases. But yes, so hormone um, disease, anything endocrine um, is definitely up there on the list of um, physical contributions to behavioral presentations for sure. Okay, then my next one is urinary tract disease. Anything that might cause urinary tract disease or anything that might cause um, perhaps increased urination, so also polydipsia, polyuria, so anything that causes pets to drink more and therefore urinate more um, can absolutely contribute to behavior. And we know that elimination problems in both dogs and cats. So in cats, that's your classic peeing outside the litter box. And in dogs, that might be house soiling, uh, starting to house soil, whether that's urination or defecation, um, can be linked to a physical disease. So 
Yes, anything that leads to urinary tract disease in cats, we're also thinking about feline idiopathic cystitis, which is a really um, complex disease and something that really sits right in between um, mental and emotional and physical health. So those stress behaviors that can cause um, cystitis. Um, yeah, so all of those things we're looking we're looking at in cats that can also include kidney disease. It can include um, diabetes mellitus, for example. If cats drink more, then they're going to urinate more, and if they urinate more, then they might not always use the litter box to do so. Um, and the same goes for dogs as well. If all of a sudden your perfectly house trained dog starts to have accidents within the home, then we need to start looking for physical health. And that could also go back to gastrointestinal health, right? If they're having diarrhea, for example, they might um, soil in the house, they might have diarrhea in the house. And all of those bring us quite nicely onto one of my very big ones that I'm going to talk a little bit longer about, and that is pain. Pain, whether that's acute pain or whether it's chronic pain, but most definitely chronic pain, perhaps musculoskeletal chronic pain, definitely causes changes in behavior. And they can be so widespread, those changes in behavior. And they absolutely can also cause your pet to um, house soil, to either eliminate outside of the litter box in cases of cats or to start having accidents around the house. Because if you're a cat and you're in chronic pain, um, perhaps, you know, you've got spinal pain or you've got pain in your hips or you're stifled, you might not want to get into the litter tray. And once you've gotten into the litter tray, it might be uncomfortable to get into that typical squatting position to urinate or defecate. And it might then also be painful to do your covering ritual after you've eliminated. And for a lot of cats, that can cause aversion to the litter box. They they experience when they go into the litter box that it's painful, it's uncomfortable, they haven't got a lot of space in there, there's not enough room to cover. Um, and, you know, and they associate being in the litter box with being painful. And so they might start to choose other areas that they will prefer to eliminate or, uh, in or on. And that could be, you know, things like beds and bath mats and clothes and areas that maybe are more on the floor. So the bath mat or a rug is is a classic presentation. And that's maybe because they don't want to get step into step over perhaps a high lip of a litter box to get into the litter box. So that's a little bit on cats for dogs. Similarly, if for dogs, um, the access to the outdoors is also associated with pain. Let's say they go outdoors and they maybe have to go down a bunch of steps to, to get into the garden, or if they have to, um, yeah, go down a flight of stairs or, or anything like that that might be um, arduous or cause them to be painful, then they might choose not to um, eliminate outdoors anymore. They might choose to just do it inside where it's easier, it's warm, it's comfortable, um, and they don't have to put themselves through that potentially painful experience of accessing the outdoors to eliminate so pain is, is a really, really big factor, obviously not just in terms of elimination, but also in terms of aggressive behaviors. If you're painful and you're uncomfortable, um, you're going to be more irritable. Uh, we also have strong neuro um, biochemical um, relationships between pain and aggression, also pain and fear and anxiety. I won't go into too much detail about that now, um, but Yes, we definitely see an increase in um, aggressive behaviors. They're often defensive behaviors. If a dog, let's say, is resting or sleeping in their bed and somebody comes up and, um, you know, strokes them or, you know, starts petting them and they're sore, then that might cause a defensive um, slash aggressive reaction. Um, and just in general life, um, you know, pain can definitely cause irritability, irritability, aggressive behaviors. It can cause intercat aggression in the household um, and it can definitely cause human directed aggression uh, in cats and in dogs and in dogs. It can also cause interdog aggression. So, yeah, pain is a, a big one. 
And as we are on the topic of pain, I want to invite everybody to have a look at the Chronic Pain Symposium that is being hosted by Canine Arthritis Management or CAM, um, which is a, a three day online event on the I think it's the 5th, the 6th, the 7th of April. I hope I didn't get that wrong. The 5th, the 6th and the 7th of April. And Hannah, who is a friend of mine and has put this whole symposium together and who is the founder and the leader of CAM, um, has put together this incredible array of speakers. So we have um, speaker, over 40 speakers from all over the world who are specialists in their field. We have pain specialists, we have veterinary behavior specialists, we have um, people working in physiotherapy. We've got all the different professionals coming together in one platform to talk about chronic pain and how we can better help our patients. And I think the focus in this symposium is massively on creating a collaborative approach to treating pain. So uh, whether you're a veterinarian or whether you're a physiotherapist or whether you are a dog trainer or whether you are a non-veterinary behaviorist or a veterinary behaviorist, we all need to come together to collaborate um, for, for these patients to get a, a collaborative um, community type approach to really make a big difference for um, the outcome of, of this patient's, these patients' health and welfare. So please have a look. I'm going to put the link also in the show notes to um, the Chronic Pain Symposium. It is possible to register for absolutely free for this event, which is incredible. Um, and it's also possible to purchase a VIP ticket um, I think if you purchase the VIP ticket, you get access to all of the recordings of the events for, I think it's 12 months after the event and a few other extras. Um, and even if you register for the VIP tickets, I believe that it's not uh, not an expensive registration. It's very affordable um, and it is going to be such an incredible event. I am so looking forward to it. And on the Friday of the event, I'm actually presenting one of my um, behavior cases that was a doggy who presented for behavioral um, reasons, but who we found uh, to have uh, chronic pain. And it was only when we managed to treat the chronic pain that we really made a big change in his behavior. I'm not gonna give too much away, but I chat you through the behavioral presentations, how I worked the case up, um, what we did in terms of a treatment plan and what the outcome was. So um, it's also all over my social media. So have a look. It's the Chronic um, Pain Symposium, which is happening on the 5th, 6th and 7th of April, the, an amazing three day online event that brings together some of the best speakers in the field of pain and pain management. Um, so, yeah, please, anybody who's interested, I think this is going to be equally interesting for vets, um, you know, vet nurses, non-veterinary um, dog care or pet care professionals. But I think also for pet owners and pet caregivers, I think there's so much that can be taken away and that can be learned. So go ahead and sign up for free. It's going to cost you absolutely nothing and have a look um, and see if you find it interesting. And yeah, it's going to be an incredible event. So um, that's talking about pain um, and how important the recognition, the assessment and the treatment of pain is in our behavior patients and our behavior cases. So those were my top five and I'm gonna sneakily sneak in a number six, which is neurological presentations. Um, and I've had quite a few and it makes sense, right? Because obviously the brain is the organ that's typically involved in neurological presentations. Although of course it also can be the, sp the spine or the peripheral nerves. Um, and behavior also happens in the brain. So it makes sense that uh, neurological presentations are going to affect behavior as well. And I actually have quite a few patients that I share with my wonderful colleague, Dr. Sergio, here at the German Veterinary Clinic um, in Abu Dhabi that we work up and work on together. We have a number of epileptic patients who also suffer from chronic anxiety. And only when we managed to address their chronic anxiety did the epilepsy get better. But obviously also neurological presentations, especially seizures, can cause a patient to become anxious because, yeah, I mean, why wouldn't you be anxious if you were experiencing these, you know, sort of um, quite scary events of having seizures? So 
That was my sneaky number six in there. But yeah, those are my top five. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, the caveat absolutely is that any physical health presentation can cause changes in behavior. And to be honest with you, in an older patient or a patient that certainly has passed their adolescence phase um, or in patients where we've got a relatively stable behavioral history and all of a sudden we see worsening in behavior in that patient, we always need to look at the physical health presentations as well. We always have to look at physical health. So in a slightly older patient, and I'm thinking here five years plus, or in a patient of any age, potentially where we've got stable behavior that suddenly deteriorates, we always want to be looking at physical health. So it's really, really important. And then just to come back to that really important point as well, that uh, we veterinarians, we need to get involved in these behavior cases. Um, they're not cases that we should be referring referring away to trainers or to non-veterinary behaviorists. We have to make sure that we're addressing those physical health uh, presentations first, if there are any, um, because without doing so, uh, the poor trainer or non-veterinary behaviorist is going to have a really, really hard time um, to change behavior. So again, a shout out for a more collaborative approach and a, a collaboration between vets and um, behavior professionals that might not be vets. Uh, we need to be working together on these patients to create the best outcome. All right. So I hope that's given you a little bit of an insight. We've literally just um, touched the surface. We've literally just scraped the, the tip of the iceberg here um, in terms of behavioral, uh, physical health um, that lead to behavioral presentations or that contribute to behavioral presentations. But it's just to get the conversation started. I'm going to do deep dives on all of these areas um, in upcoming episodes. But it's just to give everybody a bit of a sense of wow, this is really how broad it can be. And these are all the different physical health presentations that can affect behavior for so, so many different reasons. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode. I hope that's given you a little bit of an insight. Um, have a look for the Chronic Pain Symposium. It's going to be an incredible event. I'm going to put links in the show notes to all the papers that I've mentioned. Um, and obviously, also, I will put the link in there on how you can sign up for free or as a VIP, whichever you choose for the Chronic Pain Symposium. So I'm going to see you in episode 24 next week. And uh, I look forward to it. So until then, bye bye for now.